Okay, we're here with Nick Watson and Tim Debney from Fluid Mastering. Good evening. Hello. Hello. Uh, we're just going to go over a few things and some common questions uh, that get asked about mastering. I guess the obvious place to start is what is mastering? Mm, from from interesting. you guys. Um, maybe a little bit of a brief history. As, as far as I know, uh, it's, I suppose it starts with uh, cutting to vinyl. Yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. Originally, mm. originally, mastering was about getting from the old quarter inch, half inch tape to vinyl, which was pretty much the only format that was around for a, a long, long time. Yeah, um, it was everything involved in delivering how you deliver that final mix to the consumer. Yeah, all the processes that happen in between, and if a vinyl you know, it was being released in various territories, then you'd have to make various copies of the production master, and even that had to be done with a great deal of sort of skill and care back then. And yeah. uh, it wasn't a question of just clicking it and dragging it. Yeah, sure. Copying and, and the aim, I guess, there was very much to take exactly what's on that tape. Yes. And make it. The role as of mastering def By the definitely time. changed, hasn't it? I mean, it wasn't so much in the old days about that you would sit there and you would EQ the tracks, and um, obviously you would filter them and EQ them slightly, if necessary, for vinyl. But the whole process of what's required now yeah. has really changed what masterings. They, they were much broader brush strokes, really, yeah, weren't they? They were because you'd yeah. have you'd have your vinyl console, which would have two paths on it, and you'd listen through to the tracks on the master. And you might make notes saying track one maybe needs a little bit of a lift in the high end, and then track two might need a little bit of extra bass. And then and while was that for clarity off vinyl, or is that about making things both. consistent? It both, would be both. Yeah, yeah definitely. Absolutely. And obviously, certain frequencies can cause issues when you actually come to cut vinyl, uh, stereo bass, certain bass frequencies, sibilance, uh, you know, five, six, seven, eight K frequencies can cause distortion. Um, so yeah, it was a, definitely about both. But when it came to the more enhancement side of it, and in terms of bringing the tracks together for consistency, you would only be making such changes as you would then be able to tweak up while the tape was playing and while the cut was mm. physically taking place. So mm -hmm. while one track was playing, you'd be setting up the EQ for the next track on the other channel, and sure. then during yeah. the gap between them, you yeah. change channels yeah. and you so a, on. A and B paths, didn't you, on the original Neumann consoles, etc. So you wouldn't be doing, you know, really sophisticated notching of problem frequencies and uh, all the kind of really creative stuff that, that that tends to be the norm these days. Sure. When I get asked the question as when I've mixed something or if I'm producing a record, why are we sending this to mastering? What I love this mix. Why isn't it just sure? Why aren't we just using it like that? What's your guys take on that on the answer to that? <laughs> I, t I tend to take the view that um, a mix, once it's been sort of finalized and, and, and everyone signed off on it, is obviously going to sound great. You know you wouldn't have decided it was done unless it sounded great. Mm -hmm. But the point is that it sounds great to you at that time. It's a function of how close you are to it, the amount of time you spent on it, the vibe in the room at the time, and the acoustics of the room at the time. There are all sorts Most of things importantly, the acoustics that, that are going the room, to yeah. influence that, such that that same mix, if you just then said, right, we're going to trans transpose this to the outside world without making any changes to it, might actually sound really quite underwhelming, yeah. particularly like a couple of weeks later when you've, you know, you've got a bit more distance. Sure. From it. I mean, you say that about the, the acoustics of the room being very important. Why aren't we all mixing then in a room uh, set up for mastering with big PMCs yeah, or whatever? Yeah, exactly. It's called money, isn't it, at the end of the day? <laughs> it's, it's, it's budget. And, you know, there are, I think you've hit the nail on the head, really, in, the, in this day and age, because there are so many small production rooms now where people haven't had the money to spend on the acoustics of the room and the soundproofing and the layout. Um, which is all very well and good. You can get a great production, great recording out of those rooms, but I think it's all quite vital, you know, just to go and get it checked out in a mastering room that has been specifically designed and set up with acoustics in mind. That the sound, you know, uh, what was I saying? Well, I think, I think have to edit that bit. Oh, it's all right. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> There'll be plenty of my stuff yeah. to edit. <laughs> um, lost my train of thought there. Well, I'll jump in. Yeah, go on. 
I think it's important to point out that just because a mix needs some EQ doesn't mean it was a bad mix no. at all. I yeah. think you know a good mix is one that will sound great once it's been mastered. And if that mastering was a very, very small bit of enhancement, maybe a tiny bit of boost in the top frequencies and a lift in level, or if it was something a little bit more creative, if it sounds good at the end of the day, then it was still a good mix. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it just needed to be... Um, it's a question of just getting the right perspective on it. I often think that mastering is a little bit like um, if your music can be considered like a piece of like a, a sculpture, some kind of three-dimensional artwork or something. Mastering is like you walk around it until you find the best perspective to look at it from. Sure. That's kind of what we're doing, and then we get then we give everybody the opportunity to look at it from the best perspective. Hmm. That's like quite that. good. You haven't yeah. said that before. Yeah. <laughs> I said quite it in a, a pub an analogy. <laughs> you were half cut one night. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, no, no, it good. strikes me going back to your point there, Tim, about um, uh, budget as to as to why we're not all working in essentially mastering rooms. Sure. Even back in the day when there was money coming out of studios' ears yeah. um, and being spent everywhere, the recording and the mixing rooms weren't still set that. No, that's in the they same weren't. Way. They mm. weren't. No, obviously. And yeah. I'm from from my perspective, and you'll probably tell me I'm completely wrong here, but I I feel that if I were to do a mix in here, where the sound is going to be fantastic, yeah, I would probably still want it to be mastered somewhere else. Yeah, sure. Mm. Just because to get a it's second. Still our room. Yeah, exactly. Mm. It's always good to get a second, an, another pair of ears on it, basically, and to hear it in another environment and. Just to and check someone out. experienced who is not um, not as close as I would be yeah. at that point to, exactly. to the musicality. Yeah, absolutely. And you step back as a master engineer, you step back and you're listening to the overall frequency of the track. You know, are there any holes? Are there any humps? You know, are any frequencies bothering you? And it's I think it's more about just having another pair of ears, a fresh pair of ears that are trained to listen to tunes in that manner. Mm. To, to be able to come in and just yeah quite often I'll put a mix on and it sounds absolutely fantastic and you maybe will do one or two tiny little changes other times you know you put a mix on and you really feel that it you need to go to town on it there mm -hmm. are s several issues basically obviously not all that can be solved in mastering sometimes you might have to suggest a few little mix tweaks first mm -hmm. but um yeah, I do think it's it's important to go and hear it in another environment and get think, another pair of ears on the it. The thing about a mastering engineer, a professional mastering engineer, is that he spends every day in the studio working with mixes that somebody else has finished. Yeah, yeah. You know, you 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 mm. once you've spent a few years doing that, you you develop a few little wrinkles and and as opposed to the mix engineer who and, spends every day starting with something that isn't a song yet. Yeah, mm. that's and, right. Mm. And, and, and trying to end up yeah, you know, with it. Yeah. I mean, if, if, if somebody comes in here with a mix and they stick it on, the last thing I'm going to hear or be worried about is what reverb setting they used on the snare drum. Yeah. It, that's not really going to be something that I'm going to particularly pick up on. Whereas if. And you would hope that it, as, as it's come to this stage already, that's whether you think it's a the correct setting or not way to think about it mm, yeah it is it is because that's what chosen. they've gone for yeah. absolutely yeah. But, then, but, yeah. the, but then they might be actually fretting about it because mm -hmm. they didn't maybe they agonized about it for ages and they decided to make the wrong choice but at the end of the day it's not going to make a blind bit of difference to the general public no. they just want it to work mm -hmm. and that's our job is to make sure that the whole thing just works yeah and it's about consistency as well you know fair enough one track in isolation you could master it you could master it at home whatever I think if you're mastering a whole album, which obviously we spend a lot of our time doing, it's it's very important that the tracks of the album sit together properly. So it's not about just getting one track in and going, oh yeah, I'll add some bass and some top or whatever, or I'll compress this. I think it's just trying to find a balance across an album or an EP or a project. Mm -hmm. and, and very importantly, just making sure that all of the tracks are, obviously you don't want to tailor one track necessarily to match another track just for the sake of it, because you might ruin that one to make it sound like that track. But, but to make sure they flow. I think exactly, exactly, that that one's not got way more bass or it's not 3 dB louder than the others. And it's just a case of, you know, it's, it's about balancing out a final product, basically. The next question there, which is, um, 
Some people say that it shouldn't be necessary in the modern age. No, I don't think you have covered that actually. Okay. Yeah, I think um, I think it's very necessary in this modern age. One because half the plugins out there aren't particularly good. I think if you can hear them again in a in a very good acoustic environment, mm. you can then hear what artifacts and issues that those plugins, those said mastering plugins, are doing to your track. Mm -hmm. um, you know, on initial listen on a small set of, set of speakers, you can whack it through a couple of mastering plugins and think, wow, yeah, all right, it's immediately louder than my mix. Uh, it sounds a bit more controlled, but actually, once you start analysing it properly you can find that you've caused all sorts of problems. You might have over-compressed it, so you've now lost your, your punch on your drums. You might have added some widener that's messed around with the phase of the track, that's then messed around with the EQ of the track. So um, I think... We have heard some awful, awful oh, things. Yeah, totally. Where, where people have tried to do it themselves. Yeah. Totally. Um, uh, it's not to say that every that certain people can't do no. those things, you know. I, I get equally, I've had a few projects in where they've done their own mastering first as a reference for me to compare to and what they've done was perfectly fine um. I think the other thing is that uh, plugins are the way they're sold and the presets that they come <coughs> with can be a little bit dangerous for people because yeah, the presets I mean, I, I, I always I think plug-in presets are well they're the devil's uh, work let's yeah, face it yeah. it's I, mean, bit, I remember when I was first started out as an assistant of one of, the, one of the producers I worked with, the first thing he did was went around all the racks and took every digital piece of gear that was there and removed any flash right. card for saving settings or anything. Right, right. Yeah. So, no, you will recall it. Yeah. We won't save it. Yeah. And I don't want to know that that yeah. works in this <laughs> yeah. room or anything like that. Mm, yeah. And to this day, I've stuck with that. Absolutely. I, I never save a setting. And I, right. I, 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 yeah. nothing's ever in my user banks. Sure. Um, I mean, we have to store number. our settings because obviously quite often they'll come. Well, recall. Recall. exactly. Yeah. But, yeah, perfect, but actually, yeah. for it to be saved, of there, something I can just flick to. So, and then when oh, yeah, I like yeah. that snare sound on, on such that and such, track, I'll bring it in. Yeah. Here. Exactly. Yeah. No, I want to. I'll get it again. Yeah, absolutely. And that's and the, yeah. and the factory presets on mastering plugins are always a little bit brighter, a little bit louder. There's always something that's going to lead you to switch to, to, to switch the bypass in and go, oh, oh yeah, no, this is really adding something. Yes. And there's been a few plugins that we've sort of tested out in here where, you know, you're initially quite impressed, and then when you actually bring the levels in line and take out anything that is going to superficially seem to make bring about an improvement, and then you actually hear what the processing's just doing, mm -hmm. even in a fairly neutral setup. Mm -hmm. I guess it's, I mean, like, it's not oh necessarily a, a a fault of plugins as a, a way of delivering things. No, because there are some fantastic ones out there, and I think the important thing is being able to hear what they're actually doing. Yeah. You know, well, I'm thinking in terms of I uh, mm. see you guys have got the, the TC System 6000 here. Yeah. And there is, you know, there is a plug version, version of that, of that yeah. which yeah. is very close, sure. if not the same. Sure. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And absolutely. you wouldn't necessarily say, oh, I wouldn't use the plug in version, I'd always use oh, this. Oh, no. No, no. But, I'm, um, I'm thinking of. Cheaper ones. <laughs> yeah, we won't mention but, any. But names. even then, there are. Uh, I, having had a go with those, um, the, the, the plug-in versions of the six thousand, there yeah. are a massive list of presets. Mm. Right. Mm. Yeah. And probably the same applies there. Yeah. Mm. Don't click on those. Yeah. Mm. Just use the start tool. From, start from scratch. Yeah. yeah. So Find out what it does, and, and listen to your track first. Just sit there and listen to it. Mm -hmm. You know, before you do anything to it, and just think what does this need does this need anything yeah. and then what does it need and presumably as well get a bit of time between finishing the mix of and course, starting the master definitely yeah. definitely Try and do a different project first yeah, right? absolutely yeah, that on. then brings up the whole issue of when you say finish the mix first what is it going to be what's the mix what is the mix because a lot of people now when they're trying to create their mix they're referencing mastered audio that's probably been mastered to a very high level mm -hmm. I don't mean in terms of fidelity, I mean, I mean in terms of volume. volume. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and they're actually referencing that stuff while they're mixing. Yeah. So their mixes are just going up and up and up and up in volume. Yeah. And um, that creates a bit of a problem. It uh, does. Yeah. It, it would be great if people were actually um, creating mixes that actually didn't necessarily sound like the finished record, because that's our job at the end of the day. Sure. Um, Although, you know, I think uh, a lot of guys these days are mixing with bus compression on, and I think you, 
they it does work. I think the problem is when you get something that's heavily limited or clipped. I think a bit of bus compression in your mix can really gel the mix and it's a question people when they ring cold say to me, shall I leave all of this stuff on? Mm. And I'm like, well look, if you're if it's integral to the mix, so that when you remove it you lose the gel, then yeah. leave it on. Mm. If you've got it on there just because you want your track to be louder when you're mixing it, then take it off. Basically. Sure. I mean, from a personal perspective I mix with um, a bus compressor. Sure and a bus EQ. Yeah. Um, I'll usually, I know pretty much the amount of pull I'm happy with mm. on a compressor. Mm. So the first track of a project I'll mix and make sure it's not doing any more than that. Yeah. And the EQ is probably just to compensate for mm. what's happening in that compressor. Mm. And from then on I'll mix into those settings mm -hmm. for the rest of the project. Right, I see. Yeah, change them. Yeah. Yeah, um, that makes sense. Yeah. I think the so, thing is yeah, that you to me that's integral in, sure, in my mix. It's yeah, not. Yeah, it's okay. not about doing. What you're you guys not do. trying to create a, a mastering process no, yourself. Not no, up. sure. Not, not and you know anything. also what you can get away with. That's the other thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of people don't know what they can get away with, and so they'll start they'll start mixing a track. Well, some people start mastering their track before they've even written it. Mm -hmm. They get a drum loop going, and they've got a limiter across the output bus that they're hammering with their drum loop and they haven't even chosen what the bass line is going to be. This is something yet. I was just discussing actually with a client the other day, I'm, I'm doing some, some writing um, at the moment, they were very confused that I wasn't in the studio. I was trying to explain to them that if I'm writing parts, the last thing I need is all my gear there, yeah. me trying to make it sound nice before I've got the notes yeah. right. Yeah. Mm. So I'm doing it on a headphones and a laptop, Absolutely, yeah. and then we go to the studio. Yeah. But yeah, I mean if you've got exciters, stereo wideners, multi-band compressors and limiters across your output bus and you're actually driving yourself heavily into those while you're in still in the early stages of the production process then you have a situation where if you call up the mastering studio and they say well back off on that stuff as soon as you back off on that stuff the whole track falls apart mm. yeah because changed. that stuff mm. is so mm. integral to it and then you've actually created something that's almost unmasterable it can be it can potentially be, yeah okay well that actually brings us really nicely onto a question that, that came from Twitter, um, which if I read uh, exactly as it was, how about what makes a mix substandard for mastering, i.e. this can't be mastered, try again. Okay. Now if I can just say what my initial reaction was to that yep. first, which is um, for me th that question's a funny one, as I don't think mastering is, is necessarily ab about that, it's substandard for mastering is it really a concept that I understand? Um, I'm sure you guys will say that you've already hinted that there is something that's substandard for mastering. It depends what you're aiming for. Yeah. <laughs> but that, that's kind of my point, which is the mix is right yeah, what's been decided the, on. They're usually not EQ issues, I have to yeah. say. You know, you're, Mainly the things that make it substandard for mastering is, is one, the fact that it's absolutely hammered already, mm -hmm. so it makes it almost impossible really for us to do, do anything to mm -hmm. it, so what, why bother, basically. Um, clipping, distorting, um, clipping's a major issue. I mean, guys, I don't know, certain people don't understand that, you know, once you've got all your faders up on Logic or, or Pro Tools or whatever, if your output fader is sitting there constantly in the red, it's clipping, basically, and mm -hmm. you start to hear little bits of distortion in there. That's a major issue. Um, EQ things are fine because a lot of bands, a lot of stuff people want rough and ready, they might have created a really raw mix and that's great, that's the vibe of the music and the mix. That's and what I was thinking, yeah. I, the, the names that came to mind for me was the, the Strokes first album, Definitely, uh, Baby yeah. Shambles or some yeah. of the White Stripe stuff. Libertine, which is, some stuff like mm. that, also, you know, it's, it's great, it's got a punky vibe to it and it's not about necessarily trying to make it sound nice. You no, know, you know. well I just did an album yesterday that was very much along those lines, mm -hmm. and I got a brief from the client, or from the artist, who said, who pointed to one track and said, this is really, really lo-fi, this particular track, it's kind of really edgy, and what we want to do is to make sure that that's as high quality as it gets, we want to bring all the other tracks down to that yeah, level in right, terms yeah. of fidelity, and yeah. that was a really nice, clear brief, mm. because in some cases, some of the tracks just sounded a little bit polite, and I was able to really go to town in terms of making everything a bit more crunchy and aggressive and much less less polished yeah mm. because that was what it it needed well that, that was kind of my other side of this question that 
this is not the question that was asked originally, but as mastery engineers, um, can those kind of directions be problematic to you? Do you, I mean, do you have an inbuilt desire to make everything no. lovely no, and like steely no, Dan? No, no, or definitely no, no, no. God, that would be boring. I mean, yeah, I think yeah. I think we probably both got into this line of work because of the there's the variety. It's the fact that you get to work on something different every day yeah, definitely. that makes it such a great job. Yeah, yeah. And if um, you were to try and homogenise everything, that would just be so dull. Mm. I'm, I, I think you just. It's the same. It's exactly the same answer that I give when people have asked me. Well, yeah. As a mix engineer, are you trying to make the perfect mix? Yeah. It's like, well, yeah. I really don't care what other engineers think yeah. of my mix. It's about getting the people to like the it. The best it. out of it, really, isn't it? Mm. The best out of your mix for that type of music, um, and it's the same with mastering, yeah. you know, and not necessarily getting the best out of it by trying to polish it. Like I mean, you know, mm -hmm. just, just work out what the band and the producer were after when they mixed it and try and keep it as true to that mm. and just help the track along if you can in the mastering process. Sure. Yeah, it's like you figure out what direction they're heading in and try and just get them to the end of the yeah. line mm -hmm. in, that yeah. in their chosen direction yeah. is what you're trying to do. Definitely.